All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Junis. I'm the executive director at Eco Business. Uh, very happy to be having all of you here today. Join me for lunch. Uh, I hope some of you are having your lunch. Uh, if not, you know, I hope you already had yours. If not, that's fine too. Um, I promise to give you one hour of, um, you know, lots of knowledge bites to keep you going. Um, and, and today I'm very happy to be joined by my two um, experts in this area that we're going to be focusing on, which is climate risk reporting. Uh, Dennis Wan from CDP and Thomas Milburn. Oh, will be a late lunch after the session. Okay, thanks so much for sharing that. That's great. Um, the session we are having is, is, is an informal one, uh, meaning to say uh, we're going to keep it really light, informal, uh, and I promised uh, when I was sharing my uh, this post on, on LinkedIn uh, about this uh, session today that you know we're going to try to make it as personal as possible. So uh, essentially, we're going to address the why, the how, the what around climate risk reporting. And I'm sure many of you have different reasons why uh, you think this topic is meaningful to you. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it off. And uh, we're going to have three questions um, that we're going to show on the screen one by one. And if all of you could just uh, scan the QR code here or click on the link. Thank you on the uh, chat box and tell us the first question is, I'm joining this session today mainly because, okay, all right. So see if all of you can just give us your thoughts on and your perspective as to why you want to join the session today. Of course, you know, you might have other reasons as well, but maybe pick the closest one. Okay, thank you. Ah, so it seems most of you are working in the field where climate risk reporting is quite essential. Uh, great. I think this is fantastic. And it seems most of you are saying that you need to understand climate risk reporting as part of your job. Uh, so you're here taking notes, I'm sure, <laughs> today. And, and that's great. I think the purpose of today's session is really to help you to uh, clear some doubts you might have, uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions to two experts, uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, help you along in your journey as well. Uh, many of you are also saying that you are providing advisory to clients. So I assume you're probably a, a consultant, or you could be a trainer in a certain topic. Uh, great. Uh, hopefully, this is useful for you. And the third one is, I hope to apply my skills, uh, these skills in the future role. Great. I think um, in my own experience as well, many people are asking about role transition into sustainability or into climate change. Uh, and um, my actual advice to many people is uh, you could stay in your job and still find a way to uh, do meaningful work in sustainability. Uh, but that's, let's leave that for another time. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Second question. All right. Second question is in three words or less, what comes to mind when we say climate related risks? What comes to mind when you when we mention climate related risks? Um, perhaps might be physical type of risks, transitional risks. Uh, you know, it could be anything that's related to uh, technology. Uh, it could be related to policy. Anything that comes to mind. Tell us what you think. Oof. Okay. Very helpful. I saw someone write more work. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess um, in many fronts, I, I do um, acknowledge that that is true. But OK, big ones popping up is TCFD. Absolutely. That, that is very much um, synonymous today to climate related risk uh, reporting. Carbon is definitely a big one. Um, not surprising as well. Uh, interesting. Someone has mentioned uh, black box. Um, if, if you did write that, I'm curious to know what you were referring to. I sort of have something in mind, but if you don't mind just putting it into the chat box as well to tell us why you think um, the word climate related risks is to you a black box. That's very interesting. But also some people are saying opportunities. Um, it is complex. Absolutely. I, I do agree. It, is, it can be complex. Um, transition. No consensus, that's really interesting. Um, would love to hear some thoughts as well as to why no consensus comes to mind when we talk about climate related risks. Okay, um, bearing in mind again, today's session is about learning, which means uh, no question is a silly question. Uh, feel free to, you know, to populate our chat box with your perspectives, your thinking, uh, because the whole point is to help everybody to sort of decipher, to un, you know, untangle some of the things that might potentially seem like a black box might potentially be uh, seen as, as complex, uh, difficult to understand. 
uh, yeah, I guess the whole point is to help all of you, you know, untangle some of that as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And the third one, please. The third question is, in three words or less again, what do you perceive to be the greatest roadblock or hurdle for companies reporting on their climate risks? What do you think, to, in your opinion, are the greatest or is the greatest roadblock or hurdle? Mm, interesting. So, so far, the greatest roadblock we're seeing is related to understanding it knowledge related information. Um, ah, interesting, boards don't care. I definitely hear that a lot from um, the stakeholders that I interact with. Uh, governance is now popped up to be a big one. Uh, so governing uh, climate risk reporting seems to be a challenge. Lack of buy-in, that's related as well. Interesting, trans transparency. Yeah, I, I think that that's very much related to uh, reporting. Very often, whenever you report, you're uncomfortable about what you're going to disclose, and therein lies some challenges around transparency. Greenwashing, that's definitely uh, rising in the agendas for many. Even in eco-business as a media ourselves, uh, we are noticing a lot of um, stakeholders actually being very frustrated with the fact that greenwashing is becoming quite, um, you know, quite prominent in, in a lot of disclosures, uh, but also that's related to the lack of standards sometimes. Oh, interesting. Uh, lack of faith from management, uncertainty of governance, really interesting. Thank you. Not my problem kind of attitude. That's really, really interesting. And I think many of us uh, might uh, agree with that, that you know, whenever you are even responsible for climate risk reporting in your organization, uh, the ones you interact with to even obtain that data might not be thinking it's their problem. And, and that, that is a common situation we see. Um, I'm looking at a chat and uh, Ching Hu has mentioned, uh, or rather gave us perspective, black box as it appears to be a complicated mechanism, which is mysterious to the user or layman. Yeah, I, I definitely I can <laughs> empathize with that. And this is also why we decided to have a topic like this on today's session. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for your perspectives there. I think the whole point is to get everyone thinking uh, about the topic and sharing, of course, you know, your views and your frustrations uh, in the job that you're doing in, in this respect. And hopefully uh, in the next hour or so, we'll be able to sort of uh, unpick some of that as well. Okay, excellent. Now, um, I'm going to move into uh, the slide presentation. Ben, would you like to put it up maybe? And, and I'll, I'll take the control from there. Oh, I don't see it. If not, I can do it. I'll just wait for five more seconds. Thank you. All right, it's, it's coming up. Okay. Um, I suppose I might have the, uh, the rights to present, but uh, okay, one second, sorry. Just give me a second on this. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm just going to skip through these. These were the questions. Okay. So before we start, um, just a very quick uh, introduction about who we are. So many of you would probably already know EcoBusiness. Uh, I guess for the sake of those who might not, uh, we are Asia Pacific's leading media and intelligence organization dedicated to sustainable development uh, and ESG intelligence. Uh, we've been around since 2009, uh, and, and we are very much Asian-based. A lot of the thought leadership news, views, uh, research that we put out uh, focuses on the topic, especially when it comes to uh, Asia and when it comes to um, business itself. All right. Um, just want to update as well that, you know, in the last 12, no, actually 24 months since, uh, you know, I guess the pandemic started, one of the key initiatives we've been doing uh, is to ensure that the news we get uh, that gets read by a wider uh, stake audience, st stakeholder group, I would say, in Asia. Uh, and in doing so, a lot of the news that we're putting out is being translated. Uh, this is a key feature, I think, that will continue to uh, be important to us because, um, Truth be told, Asia is a fragmented market. It is a fragmented region, uh, but also it is one that is incredibly important. And so we are hoping that the news that we're putting out gets read by um, the, you know, our stakeholders uh, across the Asian Pacific region as well. Okay. All right. So without further ado, um, one first picture to get going on, on things. Um, this is a picture that I think some of you might have seen in various forms. 
Um, but I guess the message is pretty clear. It might make some of you chuckle. We have just gone through two years of COVID-19, a difficult pandemic, and it definitely touched every corner of, uh, of the planet. Uh, it has upset it everybody's lives in, in shapes and forms. And, and of course, that little you know speech bubble there that says, be sure to wash your hands and all will be well. Uh, indeed, we were told that. And, and I think, of course, what is it lies ahead is something that you know is somewhat uncertain, but somewhat scary as well. And if you look at what's ahead of us, recession being one that is already in discussion, especially with the Ukraine-Russia uh, war, uh, with an inflationary pressure that's going around everywhere, we're looking at a very difficult economic outlook. But what lies ahead on top of that is even bigger. It's bigger, it's scarier, and it's it's unknown territory that a lot of us don't uh, can't quite grapple um, uh, at this stage. Uh, somebody has asked a question about biodiversity collapse, and this is actually related very much to global warming, which is related to climate change, of course. Biodiversity collapse basically means that um, the essence of in which we as, as human beings are able to survive on this planet really relies heavily on our bio diversity ecosystems. And if this collapse, uh, there's actually no way we can reverse the trend. And this is the scariest thing because it's looking at a very bleak, um, you know, uh, situation of, um, of the next level of human extinction. Very scary, uh, or rather, you know, very depressing um, kind of outlook. But in this, in this case, one of the things as well that we wanted to put out there is that this kind of discussions might be seen as one that uh, is not a mainstream um, understanding. However, when you look at um, an assessment being done every single year by the World Economic Forum, uh, this chart actually you know, has gone through many rounds of iterations every year, uh, every year, sometime in January or so. And one of the most significant changes or developments we're seeing is uh, the understanding that climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, natural resources crises. Oops. Uh, yes. Sorry, it just went off. Yeah, if you could just put it back up. Thank you. Uh, these are things that are climbing very quickly up the agendas of many uh, experts and, and many stakeholders that are observing uh, risks from a, from a wider standpoint. A lot of these issues actually have been already simmering uh, for many years, but in the last two years or so, what we are really seeing is uh, predominantly environmental issues taking up a big proportion of uh, what we consider global risks on a, on a large scale today. And of course, this has caused um, you know, the outlook for the world to be um, you know, shaping towards the concerned uh, worried side of things. A lot of people, more than I would say 60 or 80 percent of the people are genuinely concerned uh, about the outlook that uh, that lies before us. And this is very much related to uh, the environment and to climate change as well. Next, oh, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Thank you. And um, related to this is the surge that we're seeing in climate risk reporting. Uh, this stat is just to give you an idea of uh, the, sheer, the sheer growth uh, in the number of TCFD supporters. And if you don't really understand what that means, uh, we'll go into a lot more detail about TCFD, but essentially this chart is to tell you uh, that a lot of people that are behind the scenes in banks, in non-financial institutions are definitely understanding that climate risk is very important. And in doing so, uh, you know, wanting to ensure that we are, um, you know, um, that the industries and the, the major organizations and in institutional investors are um, understanding the risk and using a, a format or supporting uh, the, the, I would would say the main predominant format, uh, sorry, recommendation, which is called Task Force for Climate Financial Disclosures, uh, to, to ensure that, you know, we are reporting on a, a more standardized and harmonized level. The growth here from 2018 to 2021 is uh, more than 40%, and it's, it's, it's continuing to grow. In fact, this number of 2616 is already outdated. The last number I saw uh, two days ago was about 3,100 or so supporters. So this number is continuing to grow. Uh, and in, in that as well, of course, the combined market capital uh, in which you know more corporations commit to climate related disclosures uh, is going to grow as well. And of course, the reason why this is happening is, is of course the fact that climate change is real. It's it's the, the 
the, the effects are becoming increasingly uh, real to many of us. And in Asia Pacific, this has never been uh, more true. Asia stands out as being more exposed to physical climate risk than any other parts of the world, uh, whether it's on heat, extreme heat and humidity, whether it's on heat waves, whether it's on physical uh, assets or infrastructure, on food systems, on natural capital, Asia is taking a, a bigger, the, the biggest brunt, I would say, or they're, they're actually taking up the largest proportion of that level of risk. That is scary, of course, uh, and this is also why Asia is one of the most uh, fastest growing regions when it comes to climate, uh, climate risk action as well. Uh, and here, as you can see, lots of flags, uh, Asian flags. And I think one message to put out there is that the regulations that are kicking in in place are kicking in hard and fast. Uh, since my time 10 years ago to today, when I first started out uh, in sustainability, um, the, the biggest, you know, I would say development that I've witnessed is uh, the action on, on climate risk and reporting. Uh, this is really encouraging, of course. And I think one thing to understand is that these regulations are aimed at essentially at cutting carbon emissions. This is also why you're seeing a lot of net zero targets uh, being you know, publicly put out uh, and, and committed to as part of a country's commitment to wanting to decarbonize. Uh, and in doing so as well, of course, one of the key areas to focus on is on the financial sector for the fact that financial sectors are you know, able to influence a lot of change. Uh, they hold a lot of uh, market capitalization and also they, um, you know, they, they obviously can drive a lot of action in the portfolios in which they invest as well. So regulators and central banks are establishing guidelines that help financial industries uh, to manage these risks. Uh, at, at this moment, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, Malaysia have ad adopted, excuse me, wider expectations um, and for non-financial sectors even to adopt climate risk reporting in the coming years. And we're going to see a lot more of that happening uh, even in China, where at the moment it's not mandatory, but it will be uh, I, I rather it, it is on the pipeline in some time to come um, and, and the other markets as well is likely to follow suit. Okay, and so I'm just going to leave with one more slide before I introduce my speakers and that's uh, the task force for climate on climate related financial disclosures. Um, these are the principles in which TCFD is governed or is, is putting out its recommendations and I think uh, we cannot deviate from um, understanding the basis in which uh, these uh, disclosures or the framework is being uh, set out upon. And there are seven of them here. One is uh, disclosures that should represent relevant information. It should be specific and complete. It should be clear, balanced, and understandable. It should be consistent over time, comparable across industries or portfolio. It needs to be reliable, verifiable, and objective, and it should be provided on a timely basis. Now, for many of you who have been traditionally reporting on ESG, uh, our typical uh, you know, ESG framework such as GRI, you'll find this very, very consistent. Um, the, the principles are, don't deviate very far from one another. And I think the whole point is to understand that these frameworks are out there to help you to understand the thinking around um, why it is it might seem complex, but actually fundamentally uh, it is practical in nature uh, and it's meant to be as reliable uh, as a source of information for those who are going to use it. All right. So um, without further ado, I'm so pleased to uh, welcome um, two experts uh, who will be taking us through the topic. Uh, and before I start, perhaps, and as you go along and you, you might be hearing lots of interesting tidbits and all that, feel free to pop in or chat with your views, uh, also with your questions, and I'll take them um, at the second half of the hour. All right. OK, now, um, maybe perhaps first up, I'd like to welcome Dennis from CDP, Regional Lead of corporate, uh, for Corporate Engagement, to do his uh, mini presentation. Over to you, Dennis. Hey, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so, hey, everybody. Uh, I believe Ben's going to put my slides up. As we get onto those slides, and even if that takes a little time, let me introduce myself. Because um, I, I guess I, I gon I'm going to tell you a little bit of my journey and why I've landed up on this stage. And that will, in fact, uh, inform you why I'm, I'm the one who's been uh, telling you about TCFD and indeed my organization, CDP, as well. So I'm actually a 22-year um, veteran of, of uh, banking. I worked for one firm for 22 years. 
Um, I've worked in Hong Kong, Tokyo, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong. My last role was uh, the COO of Hong Kong uh, Credit Suisse, um, where I dealt with board governance, uh, risk and incident management, RCSAs, regulations, things that I think you're going to find kind of familiar as we go through TCFD. But after 22 years, I left last summer and I traveled to the USA with my family. Um, this was a, uh, you know, a privilege for me to take some time off. Uh, and we traveled across the USA from uh, right to left uh, for over three months. In the end, it was me and my 18-year-old gap year daughter. Um, just on the road, we saw 20 states, 10 national parks. I saw mountains. I saw rivers. I saw an awful lot of corn. Um, I had a beautiful time with my daughter all the way up to the Pacific Northwest where we ran into forest fires, uh, apocalyptic smoke, and uh, depleted reservoirs. And I, I, I basically resolved that when I came back at the end of last year to Hong Kong, that I was going to change my focus. Um, I learned, uh, I, I, I networked, I took university courses, I learned about SDGs, GHGs, carbon budgets, climate diplomacy, and ultimately the nitty gritty of uh, disclosure, TCFD. I discovered an organization called CDP, and I came to my own conclusion that disclosure is the lever that's going to save the world. So over the next few slides, I'm not just going to tell you about TCFD, but I'm also going to tell you how CDP could help you um, implement uh, TCFD uh, and together, you know, disclosure is going to save the world. So do I have the slide there? Okay. So the first thing to do is actually, you know, talk about the, the history of, of, of TCFD a little bit. As, uh, as Junis already said, climate change is a thing. Uh, go read the science. That's not what this, this particular uh, session is about. Or indeed see it, as I saw it, fires in your face. Um, it's going to hurt nature, like our forests. It's going to hurt our resources, like our water. Um, Junis also alluded to just how much depends upon nature. If we, if we bring in the biodiversity uh, calamity that's coming as well, $44 trillion of global GDP uh, relies on nature. So it's going to hurt businesses, operations, it's going to hurt people. And it, against that backdrop, then the, the, the governments of the world, the United Nations, uh, have concluded, you know what, it's, it's a financial risk. So we all remember the Paris Agreement of 2015. Uh, 190 countries got together and concluded that they were going to do their best to limit global temperatures to under 2%, substantially under 2%, aim for 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade, not 2%, excuse me. Um, the, G, the G20 finance ministers uh, then appointed the Financial Stability Board to look at how climate risk is priced and accounted for uh, and to try and understand how they, it could be a threat to the stability of financial systems. So we see the logic there. With all of these climate-related risks, climate risks affecting the world, it's going to have a financial impact. Therefore, the Financial Stability Board asked, okay, look at what that financial impact is going to be. And not surprisingly, and quite quickly, they found all companies are under-reporting climate risk, and the capital markets don't have uh, enough data to understand and manage climate uh, change uncertainty. So the FSB then appointed the TCFD, and I don't have to read it out loud because Junis already read out the whole thing. Um, and they were to look at, on behalf of investors, lenders, and insurance underwriters, um, how to assess and price climate risk and look for opportunities as the flip side of you have risks, therefore you have opportunities. Practically speaking, what they came up with is a set of global guidelines for reporting how climate change impacts uh, corporate performance. So in the end, uh, there's four pillars. You see them on the right-hand side. There's 11 recommendations. I'm not going to explain each of those to you. Uh, uh, Thomas is also invited, and he can, he can explain those with, with far, far greater fluency, uh, with an emphasis on if you implement this kind of thing, then disclose it um, because you know greater transparency 
is is going to is going to help us uh, along in our fight. So, if disclosure is the thing, then who's CDP? CDP is the Global Disclosure System. Um, over twenty years now, we have uh, grown to uh, a, a not for profit organization that has some thirteen thousand companies. Uh, disclosing their environmental impact centrally to us. Uh, we have over 1,100, 1,152, to be precise, cities and states uh, disclosing their inform information to us. If you think about how many people live in all of those, that is a significant percentage of the world's population that's covered. Um, we ask for this information from uh, these companies on behalf of asset managers. So we have 680 and counting institutions managing over $130 trillion of assets um, for the, the, the disclosure information from public companies. So that, that's the, the key here. The CDP asks on behalf of all of this money uh, to the, the companies that that can have the impact and ask them, what are you doing? And we bring it all centrally in to, to create what is now the world's largest um, environmental repository of, of, of information. Um, that puts us at the heart of data. Um, our data is collated and then feeds to all of these names that, that, that you see. You'll even see rating agencies on there who are for profit, and they also rely on GDP data. We are also at the heart of the global disclosure ecosystem. So when you think about it um, and you, you worry about how confusing things are, the alphabet soup uh, of ESG, misdirection and confusion and stuff, actually, I'm here to deliver a good message to you. CDP is, is right behind a lot of this stuff. And CDP is probably the, the, the name that you simply have to remember. We run the Knowledge Hub for TCFD. We are a founding member of the science-based targets, which you've probably heard of. We uh, work with um, some of the, the corporate uh, initiatives out there, asset managers aiming for net zero, the RE100, focusing on encouraging private corporations to use renewable energy, even on the disclosure uh, part. Then we were with the Secretariat for the, the CDSB, which is now um, move, uh, merging into the ISSB. So we've been described as the most powerful green NGO you've never heard of. But the thing is that once your eyes are opened and you start reading about everything that's going on, you will probably start noticing CDP um, being, being the advisory or technical or knowledge partner of an awful lot of this stuff. So just remember our name. Now, how do we work? Um, I kind of alluded to it before, but here's a great illustration of how exactly it works. Uh, at the $130 trillion of money up there, the investor signatories um, want to get information on, on how uh, environmental impact is, is, is hurting their investments. So they uh, have signed with us, uh, the uh, CDP, the, our NGO, and we go and ask listed companies, please, can you disclose your environmental information to us? We'll ask in three different uh, formats, uh, focusing on climate change, focusing on water security, focusing on forests, all of this stuff, there's a reason that TCFD is, is up there at the top. All of this, uh, these, these questions that we ask, are TCFD aligned? So the, the good message out of this, uh, this, this story is also, if you work through, T, uh, through CDP, then you will end up aligning yourself. Uh, sorry, if you work through CDP, you will uh, end up aligning yourself with, with TCFD on, on a lot of these factors. Um, and we'll collect that data. Uh, on behalf of the investor signatories. <clears throat> Even more powerful though, we have found is that more than uh, companies looking at their investors and thinking, I wonder if my investors care about this, then big purchasing organizations also care about their supply chains and how green their supply chains are. So I didn't read the number to you before, but we have some 280 massive 
uh, purchasing organizations now. Um, ask you know with with a power of over six billion uh, trillion dollars of, of purchasing power. Also asking their supply chain. So more companies, what are you doing? We collect all of this information, and when when it's it's all centrally uh, in in one place, we can anonymize it. Uh, we can we can draw insights from it. We can advise uh, those those who are interested uh, in order to take greater action. One more, uh, even more powerful um, actor that has now come onto the stage is actually governments and regulators. Um, the uh, the Central Bank of France has also signed as an investor signatory with us recently. We have a. a, a a uh, memorandum of understanding with the MAS that was signed this year in March uh, uh, 2020. The SEC uh, of the, the United States issued a consultation paper also promoting how they were going to move uh, the, the markets of the, the US towards um, TCFD aligned kind of um, disclosure. And their consultation paper alone quoted CDP some 80 times. So again, if you're taking anything away from this, this, uh, this, um, this presentation, it's, I know it does sound complicated, but keep our, our, our name in mind and we can probably help you very much along the way. Right, how, if, if it's all that complicated, then how exactly uh, does, does answering a questionnaire from CDP help you? What we do, is that we've turned the recommendations, all of that com complexity uh, and the general guidance of TCFD into specific questions. Um, there's 11 recommendations. Uh, they essentially say, what do investors want to know? Our specific quest questions will then turn those, those, those should recommendations into actionable metrics. Uh, into clear, we'll give you clear guidance, we'll give you assessment criteria. Essentially, CDP is sort of operationalizing something that's really quite complex into a questionnaire format. Uh, we'll give you, uh, apart from the guidance, then you'll also end up with a score uh, on how you're doing. Um, at risk of, of, of oversimplifying now, then you could think of it this way as well. Um, the Harry Potter universe is a very complex universe. There's a lot of books in it. There's a lot of information to know about Harry Potter. But you could also log into BuzzFeed and answer a 10-question uh, personality quiz. And that 10-question personality quiz is going to tell you which house you're in. And if at the end of that, you find yourself in Slytherin, then that's probably not the house that you want to be in. So you would probably be able to say, you know what? I'm going to take some actions, answer this quiz a little bit differently, and maybe I will make it into Ravenclaw eventually. Right, we're bigger than mere TCFD. As I said before, CDP is a 20-year organization. Uh, we predate the trendiness of ESG uh, by you know a multiple of 10. We have uh, grown to be a... Um, we've grown to be able to cover sort of all aspects of environmental impact. So again, the, the, the TCFD uh, recommendations over there on the right um, are part of what you will achieve by, by uh, working with, with CDP. Um, but it, you know, T the, our, our questionnaire will actually has grown up over 20 years to, to you know, cover all, all aspects of, of environmental impact. Uh, including carbon pricing, including value chain engagement. Um, and nevertheless, on top of that, CDP is really quite nimble and adaptable. Uh, the TCFD was only announced in 2017 within one season. Then our questionnaire adapted to uh, questions that were um, aligned with TCFD. Um, and all you had to do was answer the questions, and then you would find yourself learning about TCFD in actual practice. Um, and that does mean that when new uh, regulations come along or new frameworks come along, we, can, we will probably be equally nimble 
um, and, and be able to guide you on your way. Okay, I'm not gonna read what's on the left-hand side there. That's actually it. If it really boils down to it, the four pillars and 11 recommendations are what's on the left there, and uh, others will, will be able to describe these to you in, in, in greater detail. What this slide particularly shows is that independent parties have also verified just how much uh, working with CDP will keep you aligned um, with, with TCFD. I talked about scoring um, a little bit before as well. So the end goal of, of, uh, of, of you taking the questionnaire is going to be that you'll be given a score. Um, the score, if you have 100% effort at just simply trying to disclose, then, you know, well done. But disclosure is actually just the first step on the journey to doing better. You've got to look in the mirror measure yourself and, and say, well, what am I doing um, before you can get better? But once you see, frankly, oh my gosh, that's what I'm doing, then you're probably going to be want, want, want to spread the word. And so companies uh, will, will be able to work their way up through our scoring um, by simply becoming more aware. Once you're more aware of the impact that you're having by managing uh, the, the impacts that you're having, and then hopefully getting to a leadership position. Now, just to give you a, a, a taste of how hard it is to get a, a, a leadership A from CDP, 200 out of 13,000 companies last year made it to the A list. So this is not something that's given for free, um, and it, it's something to aim for. But on the other hand, Kind of like my Harry Potter example, if you find yourself down in Slytherin at the bottom left there, then you're going to work your way up into the house of your choice. I'm not telling you which is the house that you want to do. That would be that would be opening myself up to something terrible. Um, so how credible are we? How credible is a CDP rating? And I've just already given you the statistic about hard, how hard it is to get. Uh, if 200 out of 13,000 actually get it. Again, independent source, it's quoted at the bottom there. There's a lot of raters out there. They're all for profit. We are an NGO. We have the best data. It's not easy filling in the questionnaire. If anybody uh, here wants to get in contact with me and talk uh, you know, more casually uh, about you know, actually embarking upon the journey, then I, I totally welcome it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be regional lead of uh, corporate engagement. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm also going to say to you, it's not a Harry Potter quiz. It's, it's not going to be a 10 uh, question quiz. We go deep. We ask for a lot of data. Uh, and to those people on the, on the word map uh, at the beginning who are saying that the problem with disclosure at the moment is a lack of data, actually, we know that. But the thing is that, that if you do start trying to answer the questions, even if the first go you have to say, I don't know, then that will encourage you to find out and know better as you, as you do it again and again. All right, I'm nearly at the end, guys. Um, we talked about disclosure. We've talked about how, how CDP operationalized an easy roadmap for you. Uh, to 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 comply not just with env uh, environmental disclosure uh, as as a whole, but you know obviously TCFD, which is what we're here to talk about. But we've existed for for twenty years, and for much of that time, uh, disclosure has been voluntary. Um, I I'd still hold that you know our tagline, which is disclosure, insight, action, is the lever that that's really going to help here. But it's been voluntary for this long, but you remember when I told you about the history of TCFD and the seniority of the G20 and the FSB um, uh, who, who were behind TCFD? Not surprisingly, man, many, many of the countries are now making uh, disclosure mandatory. Um, so, you know, if, even if you, you didn't want to do it because it's the right thing to do, and I hope I'll have convinced you that. It's, it's not disclosure for the sake of it. You start disclosing and then you're going to want to do better. Then more and more countries are, are simply making it a, a requirement now. Oopsie. 
over enthusiastic there. And here finally is a example of, of uh, you know, just all of the confluence of all of that, that stuff coming together now. Um, numbers of, of disclosing companies have rocketed to CDP alone uh, in the past few years. Uh, we've practically doubled in the past two or three years in numbers of companies that are, are, are disclosing to us. Um, and, you know, we, we are, we're very proud uh, to be able to say that, that as an NGO with the largest uh, repository of, of environmental data in the world, um, then it, it's like it's, it's starting to build a picture more than just the, the overall scariness and the flying blind that the world is doing. If we can gather more corporate data together, we will all together form more of a vision, more of a dashboard in order to be able to figure out what to do next. So um, before I hand it over to, to uh, my fellow speaker here, there's three things that I want you to remember about TCFD. It's not actually that hard. Um, if, if I think about it from a, a, uh, my, my finance background, my finance and governance background, then what is actually uh, proposed by TCFD is just robust corporate governance and uh, risk management. Number two, though, it's forward-looking. This is really very exciting about TCFD. It, it puts climate risk uh, disclosure on the board agenda and forces it, uh, climate risk uh, reporting to be held to the same standards as financial reporting. If you look at financial statements, they're backward-looking. It's just what happened before. That's what get, gets audited. But TCFD is making the board look at the future and, and then disclose what they're doing about the future. And the third thing I need you to remember is simply, look, climate change um, is, is, is happening and TCFD is coming whether you like it or not. So if you want a questionnaire-based roadmap to guide you on your environmental stewardship, then CDP is where you want to start. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Dennis. That was very nicely summed up. Uh, and I know you had a lot to share. So thank you very much for taking the time. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to bring on Thomas, uh, an old colleague of mine, trusted friend, uh, you know, always enjoyed listening and, and, and learning from him myself. So um, yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Thanks, Junis. And uh, another four letter acronym for everyone, TGIF. Uh, so <laughs> nice one. <laughs> yeah. If you have a, a bingo card for four letter acronyms, you're going to definitely win today. Um, but no, uh, you know, delving into what I want to share a little bit about is, is kind of what, from a company perspective, corporate citizenship, we're a uh, consultancy that specializes in responsible and sustainable business. And over the last 25 years, we've been working with uh, companies from across different sectors from all around the world uh, to integrate and embed um, ESG or uh, you know, before the term ESG, we talked about responsible and sustainable business practice. Before that, we talked about triple bottom line and creating shared value. And before that, we talked about CSR and other things. So, um, you know, we've been around and we've seen the shift um, and what's been changing over that period. And I think, you know, one of the key things I would say is, um, you know, not just in corporate citizenships, 25 years, um, but I've been with the company nine years, been in the space uh, about 15 years. And in the past, a lot of action, climate change isn't new. Um, I saw popping up on my YouTube, obviously my, my um, cookies are working in my browser, but popping up on YouTube, a talk uh, to the, um, uh, in the US about climate change from 1987. And so this has been, uh, on the agenda for a long time. Um, and I think previously where, you know, sustainable business practices were primarily voluntary, they were driven by kind of NGO action and, and, and the kind of goodwill of companies as well as, as regulators to kind of drive um, uh, practice. I think today the sh real shift is that TCFD and the emphasis is coming from investors and financial markets. And this has created a real step change. 
um, in, in terms of corporate action, putting the, the, the agenda in the boardroom. Um, and I think that's why uh, we're all kind of <laughs> trying to get to grips with, you know, over the last five years or so, that pace of change has really, really increased. So <clears throat> one of the things um, that I think has come from this is, is that's shifted the focus away from in the past and, and the GRIs just about as old as corporate citizenship. It's been around for about a couple of decades as well. And um, the Global Reporting Initiative, um, it was established at a time where um, it was about trying to get companies to be accountable and responsible for their external impacts on society and the environment. And so a lot of corporate reporting and, and disclosure action to date has been about helping companies account for and report on how they're impacting um, the world. And in, in the case, since we're talking about climate change, how they're impacting the climate. And so here, you know, companies are asked, you know, what is your carbon footprint? Are you, have you set a, a reduction target? How are you doing the right thing? The step change now that investors and, 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 and lenders and insurers and financial markets in general have woken up to the fact that ESG is linked to value creation. Um, the step change is really we've gone from thinking about um, the outward impact of companies on society and the environment to actually saying, well, we also need to understand so that we can allocate capital um, in the right way how the climate is going to impact the company. So the kind of what we would refer to as inward impacts. Um, and, and this is really uh, where TCFD is coming from. Um, and so it's about helping and driving better disclosure on the financial impacts of climate related risk, risks and opportunities that companies face uh, in order to give investors and others better information. What this gives to a company is an opportunity to do a few things. One is by understanding these issues um, and integrating them into your strategy, your financial planning, your risk management. It isn't about just doing the right thing and, and, and helping to um, uh, make the world a better place, which it, we should all do. It's also about building kind of the resilience of the business to these risks. And it's also about ensuring that you're staying relevant to the changing needs um, and expectations of society uh, and taking advantage of those opportunities. Because um, I think as Dennis mentioned earlier, the flip side of any risk is an opportunity. And then finally, because it is about disclosure and uh, we'll talk a little bit about mandatory requirements that, that, uh, for TCFD, um, it's also about ensuring you have access to capital because you know, the money is talking and whoever said the board doesn't care, um, I, I absolutely agree with that sentiment. Um, Junus, I, you know, I'm lucky to be in Singapore because of Junus in some ways. Uh, when I first came over, we were working together and um, one of the big asset managers we spoke to early on uh, didn't see the value in ESG. And that was about six, seven years ago. Uh, I think, Junus, you remember the conversation well. Um, but today that's shifted. So if you're going to have um, you know, big, large institutional investors and others driving this agenda. That's where the, the, the rubber hits the road. So I, I do believe that change is happening. Um, although obviously for some organizations, it's not quite happening fast enough. Um, so let me try and get into some of the meat because I think you've had quite a lot of, of context. Um, just focusing on Singapore, uh, they've introduced uh, at the end of last year, announced they're bringing in uh, mandatory uh, climate related disclosures, um, starting with the FY kind of 2022, so reports coming out next year. And this will be on a complier explained basis for all listed companies. And so there's been a big flurry, um, <laughs> as you can imagine, of people trying to get to grips with this. Uh, people who aren't even necessarily coming from the sustainability field, company secretaries, finance directors, um, and others, uh, trying to understand well, you know, climate change is it's not something we're used to. Uh, so what does this mean and how do we comply? Um, and over time, that's going to become increasingly mandated for, for, for certain key sectors, as you can see. And essentially, what's being asked for by SGX and, and certainly, you know, the other stock exchanges and regulators from around the world that were shared is to apply these 11 recommendations. And I'll just 
take a moment to talk through this, you know, in the 10 minutes I have, um, I'm not going to be able to go into full detail, but just to kind of cover off the, the essence of, of the TCFD uh, in a nutshell. Um, it's split into four key pillars, you know, uh, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets. And, and this is a fantastic framework because essentially it should align with how the business deals with, you know, any sustainability topic and, and probably any topic, you know, that they're, they're, they're trying to address. Um, from a governance perspective, the TCFD essentially wants to know, you know, how are you ensuring appropriate oversight and management of climate change issues? How are you making, and how are you doing that at two levels? Firstly, at the board, because they're the ones who are essential to, to steering uh, the, the direction of the company and ensuring that things are kind of um, uh, done uh, properly and in the interest of, of, it, of, the, of the key stakeholders. And then secondly, at the management who level, who have responsibility for actual kind of implementation and driving it. And so how are you ensuring that those people are understand climate, the climate risks and opportunities and are skilled and, and, and made aware and able to, to exercise that governance in their respective um, positions. So you need to embed that and tell the world, tell, tell your stakeholders how you have done so to give them confidence that yes, you are a well-managed organization. Uh, the next two pillars I'll talk about a little bit together, strategy and risk management. So um, what's asked in terms of disclosure is that from a strategy perspective, um, you are talking about what are you identified and are able to talk about what the risks and opportunities over the short, medium and long term that your company faces. You're able to describe the potential impact of the, these risks and opportunities will have on the business strategy and your financial planning. And um, you have done this taking into account different climate scenarios. Um, someone asked a question of why are we talking about just risks? Why aren't we talking about mitigation? Well, we are talking about mitigation and, and, and we are talking about um, you know, different scenarios. We hope and that we will drive towards obviously a 1.5 degree scenario and, and, and there'll be a rapid decarbonization across industry sectors. Um, but TCFD does ask you to test the company's resilience across a variety of different scenarios. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And, and essentially risk management is kind of underpinning and very linked to the ABC disclosures of strategy. So you have to describe what the risks are and how, you, and, and, and how they have financial impact and what you're doing about it. Um, but uh, under risk management, you have to describe and have a proper process in place to identify and assess these risks to ensure that you're able to then, you know, uh, put in place appropriate controls and, and, and kind of manage the risks. Um, and ultimately, um, this process should be built into the overall risk management um, of the company. So it should be embedded. Um, this is, 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 is kind of tricky for a number of reasons. Uh, climate change is quite novel for a lot of companies. Um, it has very different time horizons. Climate change is absolutely happening today, and there's a lot of things we need to understand and take action on, but it will increase. And the further out you look, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, the potential uh, severity of those risks increases. And so that long time horizon, most companies think in terms of you know, the next financial year, maybe they have a three to five year business plan. Um, but for a lot of organizations, they're, they're investing in assets that have a 20 or 30 year life cycle. Um, so it is important we understand um, long-term risks that we're making appropriate business decisions today. Okay, I'm gonna be run out of time very shortly. Uh, metrics and targets, that's, uh, you know, I think fundamental if you don't measure something, you can't manage it. Um, but it's not just about scope one, two, and three emissions. It's also about understanding your exposure, reducing that exposure to potential climate risks understanding what the opportunity is. So if you have potential green products and services, you know, um, trying to drive those into the market, what percentage of revenues are coming from that, et cetera. Um, so <laughs> uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about scenario analysis because um, that's something that a lot of, it sounds fancy um, and a lot of people get stumped there. But essentially, 
you know, we do scenario analysis in business all the time. What do we think the future holds and how can we better prepare our business for that future? Um, we forecast all the time and, and we, for, we, we often have an optimistic forecast, pessimistic forecast. So, you know, language aside, this is, this is essentially about looking into the future, using climate science and different scenarios, climate scenarios, to understand how might your business be affected in these different scenarios and how resilient are we and what can we do to build resilience, right? And so on screen here, I have two, um, I would say extreme scenarios at 1.5 degrees, which, you know, fingers crossed we're on our way towards, um, is gonna have high transition risks and transition risks are essentially the risks and opportunities that come from uh, rapid decarbonization. So, likely increases of carbon tax and we've seen singapore government increase you know their initial carbon tax you know mandates on regulated on certain products and services um shifts in consumer demand changes in kind of technology and disruption within your industry um, due to the rapid decarbonization um, on the flip side because it's always useful to test yourself how you know what against extremes and how you'll perform is a kind of higher physical risk scenario and here, you know, we can look at um, the kind of extreme weather events that, you know, we hear about all the time, rising sea level rise, extreme weather events. But I think a lot of people automatically assume, well, I'm not coastal or, you know, I don't think I'm that exposed to extreme weather. Or I'm not a, an agricultural company or whatever it is. But actually, the more you look at this, the more you understand how interdependent your business model is on supply chains and other things. We've, we've over the last two years, seen that massive disruption and, under, and seen how the economic impact. So um, there's a lot of interdependencies and interconnections around um, you know, the, the economic world we've built. And there's a lot of inter, uh, interconnections and, and dependencies within the environment on which we rely. And, and so um, uh, it's, it's even if you don't have obvious physical risks, um, you'd be surprised at, at how, um, when looking at, at uh, climate change, how it might impact your, your business and your ability to drive value creation in the long term. Okay, so um, we're pretty much on time and I'm going to take up one more minute before pausing and hopefully if people are still happy to stay on for a minute or two, we can answer questions. Um, but I think the final couple of things I would say on this is, uh, look, we live in a world of uncertainty. Climate science is not perfect. Um, anything that's worth doing is, is worth doing poorly at first and then building up your capacity to do it well. Um, and so when you're going through the TCFD recommendations and thinking about the resilience of your business, it'll be hard to think out to 2050 and 2070. And it'll be easier to start with, okay, what are we doing in the next couple of years? What about the next five years? What about the next five to 10 to 2030? We already know the rises in energy costs, carbon pricing, we, there's things we can predict. Um, and, and there's things we can already build into um, our strategy and financial planning, et cetera. Um, and then the very, very final thing I'll say, this is, this is uh, adapted from SGX. Um, whether you follow this model or not, it's a journey. You don't need to apply all 11 recommendations on day one. Build slowly, start with establishing that governance, start with building the understanding and capacity of, of, of your functions, because it, it's not just gonna be a sustainability functions responsibility. It's gonna involve finance, it's gonna involve strategy, it's gonna involve risk, it's gonna involve operations. Um, and so uh, take it as a journey and every journey is one step at a time. Uh, I'll stop there. And if there is any more time for questions, happy to have them, but thank you for listening. Guys, we just made it then, <laughs> one or two. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm afraid we, we don't have time for questions, but you know, well done. I think you guys covered so much ground that all I'm gonna say is your email addresses are in the chat box. Uh, whoever who wants to contact you guys, for, for clarifications or for follow-up, please do so directly to the guys. No money is paid in these things. We just want to help one another. So um, with that, thank you so much for joining us in the last hour and uh, hope to see you guys again. Thank you both, Dennis and Thomas. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your, uh, inviting us, Pianist. Pleasure. Pianist.
Bye, everyone. Thank you.